It's a pleasure uh, to, to give you my time because I know what the Jewish National Fund is doing. I know it's not just the people down south who are helping pick the vegetables and the fruit. I know it's year, uh, all year long that the Jewish National Fund is there helping Israel in any way it can. And I know now you've got this project building together, which is, is focused on rebuilding those parts of the areas around the Gaza Strip that were so decimated, that were destroyed, that were burnt, and to support our national effort to try to rebuild those communities. And it is really, really appreciated. And, and when Mark said a moment ago that he said how much people appreciate what you're doing, that's an authentic reflection of, I think, of all the Israeli people. They know what you're doing, and they very, very much say thank you to Daraba, to the Jewish National Fund for your efforts. I thought I'd answer your questions, and, and, and your people can ask me any question that they like. But I thought I'd speak, speak for a few minutes just about what's going on in the north, because it's been in the newspapers recently. Obviously, the focus has been on Gaza. But increasingly, people are talking about what's going to happen in the north. And I'll try in a, a few sentences to try to explain so people can understand what's going on. So in, in the northern communities in Israel have been evacuated. We've got literally tens of thousands of displaced people in the north. All the communities that are adjacent to the Lebanese border have been evacuated. They've only got like uh, skeleton staffs there at the moment, security teams and and people who have to be there to do the work, but all, most of the civilians have been uh, relocated down south uh, or in the center of the country and so forth. Uh, and that's because since this terrible war started, uh, since the Hamas attacked, uh, uh, we've had all the time uh, fighting, cross-border fighting on the border. So far, the, 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 the fighting has been restricted to the immediate area of the Israel-Lebanese border. Uh, but there's been uh, fighting, difficult fighting. Uh, we've lost people, we've lost soldiers, we've lost civilians. Uh, we've been, of course, shooting back, hitting back at Hezbollah targets there in the south. Um, uh, and I, I think I know we, they've been paying a much higher price than us. But so far, we've kept the conflict contained. There is a question, of course, will Hezbollah escalate the conflict? So far, they haven't done so. They have the ability, they have the missiles, they have the capability to hit targets deep inside Israel. They could hit Tel Aviv if they wanted with their rockets. But, but so far, they've refrained from doing so, possibly because they are concerned about Israel's response. So why they have the capability, they're seeing what we're doing against Hamas in Gaza. They've seen the effectiveness of the IDF in dealing with this crisis, and they know that if they start an escalation in the north and if it goes beyond these sort of border clashes that we've seen, that they will see a very strong and uh, committed Israel defense forces. Uh, and let me be clear here, if Hamas took us by surprise on October 7th, and we paid dearly for that surprise, we paid in blood for that surprise, uh, we're not going to be taken surprise in the north. We are mobilized, we are ready, and if Hezbollah in the north decides to escalate the situation, they will have to deal with the full resolve and resources of the IDF. But let's presume that Hezbollah, for its own reasons, decides just to keep everything uh, uh, limited, which is, which is a possibility. They might not want to escalate for their own reasons. Even in such a situation, I have to tell you that Israel will not go back to the reality on the northern border of October 6th. Because then you had Hezbollah terrorists armed right on the border, eyeball to eyeball with the Israeli communities. And we know that Hezbollah forces have been training for years to do the same sort of attack that Hamas did in the south, to come across the border uh, uh, and to kill Israelis, to butcher us. And they've, uh, there's more of them than Hamas. That's the truth. They are a more formidable enemy numerically. And they share Hamas's uh, fanaticism. So what we're saying, and we're telling our American friends, uh, you know, I was in a conversation with the Secretary of State when he was here a week ago, and it was said very clearly, Israel refuses to go back to the reality. Now there's a UN resolution from before, uh, uh, from uh, immediately following the, the Lebanon war of 2006. And that UN resolution says there should be no armed Hezbollah south of the Leitani River. 
And Israel is saying, now it's time. We refuse to see Hezbollah on the border. They have to be pushed back. I mean, ultimately, they shouldn't be there at all. They should be disarmed. That's in the same UN resolution. But as a first step, Hezbollah has to redeploy north of the Litani River. That's a UN Security Council resolution. And what we're saying to the Americans, we don't want to have a fight. And if you can get Hezbollah to move back uh, uh, away from the border uh, peacefully, diplomatically, through carrots and sticks, fine. But let me be clear, the IDF uh, uh, will not uh, uh, agree, and Israel will not agree to have Hezbollah right on the border. They have to move back. A and if we want our civilians to move back to their communities in the north and feel safe, uh, they'll only do it when we've moved Hezbollah back away from the border. And that is the challenge. One way or another, Hezbollah will be pushed away from the border. If it can be done peacefully through diplomacy, and we're giving the Americans the time to do that, uh, um, that's a good thing. But if necessary, we'll have to use other means to push them back. But one way or another, Hezbollah will no longer be on the frontier, eyeball to eyeball with the Israeli communities there. That's not a sustainable uh, uh, situation. We saw what happened when we had Hamas right on our border. We won't have its twin brother, Hezbollah, in the north in the same situation. And it's crucial, it's imperative that they're no longer there. And with that, I'm happy to answer your questions. So, Ambassador, we have, uh, we'll take just uh, two questions um, for timing purposes. The first one is, um, for those families that were displaced, what do you think the timing is of those people to return to their communities? So, so the truth is the timing depends on the security situation. I spoke about it in the north that people are feeling uh, anxious about returning too early when Hezbollah is still on the border. And in the south, of course, people want to be sure that there's not going to be a, uh, uh, some sort of resurgent Hamas and they'll be threatened again. So I think that question can only be answered when we see the uh, what happens you know on the ground we are destroying hamas as we speak in in the northern gaza strip hamas no longer operates in an organized brigade or battalion structure of course they're still there but they're they're in small squads they're unorganized they still dangerous but the threat that they posed before october 7th in the north is not there anymore and we'll be destroying the tunnels there too in the south and the center of the gaza strip where we started later so it'll take a bit more time, but we will destroy Hamas and we will create a new a strategic reality in Gaza. And when that happens, I think the, the population of those communities by the border will feel much more comfortable uh, to return to their homes. And I think it'll be the same in the north. When Hezbollah is pushed away uh, uh, from the frontier, from the Lebanese-Israel border, it'll be much easier to have people come home. And then uh, the last question is, um... And this this is sort of a, a maybe a difficult one because it has to do with spirit. What's the the government's plan for rebuilding, let's say, the spirit of the small businesses and communities in the north and in the south? I mean, ultimately, we've got areas, and and you at the Jewish National Fund, you're involved in this, but we've got communities that were decimated. There are communities where thirty percent of the people were either killed or taken hostage. Terrible, terrible attacks on on different communities in the south now these people are resilient but the government will be there to help them and with the help of of groups like uh, organizations like the jewish national fund we've got to give them the tools to succeed we've got to give them the fishing rod so they can catch fish metaphorically of course and, and we'll be there and we will see these communities rebuilt and we will see a thriving uh, uh, areas outside the gaza strip that when the border is quiet and people don't have to fear Hamas, we can build some of the most beautiful and successful areas of Israel. We, we can really succeed there. Uh, with, with the Hamas threat destroyed, I have optimism that these areas can become success stories. Uh, and it'll be the same in the north. Uh, these are communities that have suffered uh, for so many years under Hamas rocket fire. And it's, you know, with that, when that threat is gone, we can really uh, uh, achieve something. You should know, and you asked me about spirit. This country's spirit has been showing itself since October 7th at its finest. Israelis have come together. You spoke a moment ago about, you know, Mark with his 
with the group, uh, uh, the, the delegation you had that was down in the South, you know, helping farmers pick their fruit and vegetables. My wife was down today with a group of women her age who went down South and they've been volunteering and going down regularly. And because it's needed, because a lot of the foreign workers obviously left the country when the when the violence happened and 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 some of their fellow foreign workers were killed by Hamas and, and they didn't think they had, you know, they wanted to stay though. Many did, but unfortunately many left. And so you see Israeli society getting together and and Mark spoke about the Israelis who are cooking, volunteering to to give food for the soldiers. Now the Israeli army gives them food, but people want to make sure they get the very best. And so you see all these Israeli chefs and Israeli cooks going down to the border and bringing their food for the soldiers who are risking their lives for the future of the Israeli people. We've seen the, this outpouring of national unity, of good citizenship, of Zionism, of people coming together. And you know, Israel has been polarized over the last year. Uh, Israel has been a very polarized politically, maybe like the United States, you know, uh, political uh, people from the left and the right and secular and religious. I think what the terrible events of October 7th were a bit of a slap on the face and a wake up call. Because when Hamas crossed the border and, and started to murder people, they didn't ask us, did we like the prime minister or not like the prime minister? They didn't ask us if we're left or right or secular or religious. They killed everyone. And I think this is an important point for us to remember. We as a Jewish people, we as a state of Israel, we have a destiny. And though we can passionately argue about politics, and we will, when this is over, we'll go back probably to business as usual, and we'll have our debates, but we should always remember what unites us. We are one people, with one destiny responsible for the Jewish state. And I think part of that wake up call that we got on October 7th, on October 7th, we have to make sure that continues into the future. And here, the outpouring of support we've seen from diaspora communities, from your community in the United States, everything that you're doing at the Jewish National Fund is part of that spirit of Jewish unity that you said before that people could, 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 could get it by a tree, plant a tree in Israel for a soldier, for an IDF soldier. That is, I think, a wonderful thing to do. And I think that's a symbol of the unity that you can be a Jew and live in Brooklyn or you can be a, a Jew and live here in Tel Aviv. It doesn't matter. One people, one future, one destiny.